It seems to me that Stoicism has experienced a popularity boom recently in our culture. Perhaps in a stimuli-addicted world, a philosophy of indifference is only natural. However, as we will discuss later, there's indeed nothing natural about the Stoic way of thinking. Before we delve in, we must firstly briefly answer a fundamental question. What is the idea behind Stoicism? In essence, this philosophy teaches the development of self-control, resilience, and virtue as a means to achieve inner peace and live in accordance with nature. Stoics emphasize focusing on what is within our control, accepting what is not, and cultivating an attitude of indifference to external circumstances. Keep this in mind for the rest of the video. My personal experience with reading Stoicism has been different. I have heard admiration for this philosophy, especially from those who seemingly are quite unsatisfied with their life, or at least their work. I would even like to quote a graffiti from my city, a stoic endurance of a second-rate existence. Well, that says it all, doesn't it? But I diverged. When I read Seneca or Aurelius, having been told about their profundity, I was quite let down. While I couldn't rationalize why, their thinking nevertheless seemed superficial. Yes, partly because both philosophers were plenty wealthy yet were lecturing on the worthlessness of material goods. One must embody their belief because otherwise it is not belief but simply hypocritical moralization. However, it was not just a paradoxical theme. Whenever Seneca or Aurelius were tackling the subject of pain or suffering in general, it seemed cursory. It felt as if they were merely glancing over the horrors of life, which for my thinking is the essential part in question, conveniently not truly facing that problem. Anyways, as I mentioned, I couldn't properly verbalize what seemed off until I reread something. Nietzsche, what would this channel be without him, was quite famously an adamant critic of Stoic philosophy. Nietzsche perceived Stoicism with its emphasis on self-control, discipline, and its disdain for passion and desire as a denial of life. I will quote a passage from his book Beyond Good and Evil. Quote, You want to live according to nature. Oh, you noble Stoics! What fraudulent words. Think of a being such as nature is prodigal beyond measure, indifferent beyond measure, without aims or intentions, without mercy or justice, at once fruitful and barren and uncertain. Think of indifference itself as a power. How could you live according to such indifference? To live, is that not precisely wanting to be other than this nature? Is living not valuating, preferring, being unjust, being limited, wanting to be different? And if your imperative live according to nature meant at bottom the same thing as live according to life, how could you not do that? Why make a principle of what you yourselves are and must be? The truth of it is, however, quite different. While you rapturously pose as deriving the canon of your law from nature, you want something quite the reverse of that, you strange actors and self-deceivers. Your pride wants to prescribe your morality, your ideal, to nature, yes, to nature itself, and incorporate them in it. You demand that nature should be nature according to the Stoa, and would like to make all existence exist only after your own image, as a tremendous eternal glorification and universalization of Stoicism. All your love of truth notwithstanding, you have compelled yourselves for so long, and with such persistence and hypnotic rigidity, to view nature falsely, namely stoically. You are no longer capable of viewing it in any other way, and some abysmal arrogance infects you at last with the bedlamite hope that, because you know how to tyrannize over yourselves, Stoicism is self-tyranny, 
nature too can be tyrannized over. For this, for is the Stoic not a piece of nature? But this is an old and never-ending story. What formerly happened with the Stoics still happens today as soon as a philosophy begins to believe in itself. It always creates the world in its own image. It cannot do otherwise. And suddenly it all started clicking into place. However, the relationship between propositional philosophy and drama always fascinated me. So, instead of commenting on this passage of Nietzsche, I would like to first introduce you to another, perhaps unexpected, source of Stoic critique and my thinking for this essay, Anton Chekhov. He was a brilliant 19th century short story writer and his masterpiece, Ward No. 6, discusses Stoicism through its two main characters, Dr. Andrei Yefimich and patient Ivan Dmitrich. I will read a few passages from this story which I hope will do the work of better explaining Nietzsche for me. No, one can be insensible to cold as to every other pain. Marcus Aurelius says a pain is a vivid idea of pain. Make an effort of will to change that idea, dismiss it, cease to complain, and the pain will disappear. That is true. The wise man, or simply the reflecting, thoughtful man, is distinguished precisely by his contempt for suffering. He is always contented and surprised at nothing. Then I am an idiot, since I suffer and am discontented and surprised at the baseness of mankind. You are wrong in that. If you will reflect more on the subject, you will understand how insignificant is all that external world that agitates us. One must strive for the comprehension of life, and in that is true happiness. Comprehension, repeated Ivan Dmitrich, frowning. External, internal. Excuse me, but I do not understand it. I only know, he said, getting up and looking angrily at the doctor, I only know that God has created me of warm blood and nerves, yes, indeed. If organic tissue is capable of life, it must react to every stimulus, and I do. To pain I respond with tears and outcries, to baseness with indignation, to filth with loathing. To my mind, that is just what is called life. The lower the organism, the less sensitive it is, and the more feebly it reacts to stimulus. And the higher it is, the more responsively and vigorously it reacts to reality. How is it you don't know that, a doctor, and not know such trifles? To despise suffering, to be always contented, and to be surprised at nothing, one must reach this condition. And Ivan Dmitrich pointed to the peasant who was a mass of fat, or to harden oneself by suffering to such a point that one loses all sensibility to it. That is, in other words, to cease to live. You must excuse me, I am not a sage or a philosopher, Ivan Dmitrich continued with irritation, and I don't understand anything about it. I am not capable of reasoning. The Stoics, whom you are parroting, were remarkable people, but their doctrine crystallized 2,000 years ago and has not advanced and will not advance an inch forward, since it is not practical or living. It had a success only with the minority which spends its life in savoring all sorts of theories and ruminating over them. The majority did not understand it. A doctrine which advocates indifference to wealth and to the comforts of life and a contempt for suffering and death is quite unintelligible to the vast majority of men, since that majority has never known wealth or the comforts of life and to despise suffering would mean to it despising life itself, since the whole existence of man is made up of the sensations of hunger, cold, injury, loss, and a hamlet-like dread of death. The whole of life lies in these sensations. One may be oppressed by it, one may hate it, but one cannot despise it. Yes, so I repeat, the doctrine of the Stoics can never have a future, from the beginning of time up to today, you see continually increasing the struggle, the sensibility to pain, the capacity of responding to stimulus. 
In this lengthy passage for a YouTube video lies the essence of Chekhov's critique spoken by his character Ivan Dmitrich. However, I must quote a line further down the dialogue which frames the Stoic mentality even more comically. In fact, you have seen nothing of life, you know absolutely nothing of it, and are only theoretically acquainted with reality. You despise suffering and are surprised at nothing for a very simple reason. Vanity of vanities, the external and the internal, contempt for life, for suffering and for death, comprehension, true happiness, that's the philosophy that suits the Russian sluggard best. You see a peasant beating his wife, for instance. Why interfere? Let him beat her. They will both die sooner or later anyway. And besides, he who beats injures by his blows not the person he is beating, but himself. To get drunk is stupid and unseemly, but if you drink, you die, and if you don't drink, you die. A peasant woman comes with a toothache. Well, what of it? Pain is the idea of pain, and besides, there is no living in this world without illness. We shall all die, and so, go away, woman. Don't hinder me from thinking and drinking vodka. A young man asks advice. What he is to do, how he is to live. Anyone else would think before answering, but you have got the answer ready. Strive for comprehension or for true happiness. And what is that fantastic true happiness? There's no answer, of course. We are kept here behind barred windows, tortured, left to rot, but that is very good and reasonable because there is no difference at all between this ward and a warm, snug study. A convenient philosophy. You can do nothing, and your conscience is clear, and you feel you are wise. No, sir, it is not philosophy, it's not thinking, it's not breath of vision, but laziness, fakerism, drowsy stupefaction. Yes, cried Ivan Dmitrich, getting angry again. You despise suffering, but I'll be bound if you pinch your finger in the door, you will howl at the top of your voice. Brilliant. Chekhov although almost satirically, encapsulates fully what I felt when reading the Stoics. He also perfectly conveys through Ivan Dmitrich's dialogue Nietzsche's criticism of Stoicism. That is of course due to Chekhov having read Nietzsche's works. The wish to be indifferent and cold, therefore unaffected by the stimuli of life, both positive and negative, can be viewed psychologically as a regressive defense mechanism. Let me explain. Regression is a mechanism through which a person, when faced with enough stress, reverts to an earlier developmental stage. You can think of an adult having a temper tantrum, throwing and breaking things, stomping, hysterically sobbing, and so on. What both Chekhov and Nietzsche point out is that being alive means to be the opposite of indifferent. A living organism reacts. The more advanced the organism, the more complex and sensitive it is to the outer world. Hence, in this framework, you can understand why a human wishing to have the sensitivity of a rock seems regressive. Furthermore, Chekhov goes after the secondary gain of embracing Stoic philosophy, convenience. It is convenient to be neutral and apathetic. It is comfortable to have a rationalization at hand whenever the impulse to act arises and use this philosophy as a tool to numb your inner moral outcry. Reacting is scary. Getting involved is disagreeable. To live, that is the hardest challenge of all. Perhaps the rise in comfort and standard of living in the West runs parallel to Stoicism's popularity. Quote, it had a success only with the minority which spends its life in savoring all sorts of theories and ruminating over them. End quote. And so, without dragging on, in summary, indifference is convenient, and so is Stoicism. Happy suffering.